you to open your Bible to the 119th Psalm, and we'll start with verse 12, and read through verse 16. The 119th Psalm, beginning with verse 12, we're going to have a word of praise out of the 119th Psalm for a few Sabbaths. It's a big psalm, it has a lot of good stuff in it. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimony. As much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes and I will not forget your word. I love that part. I will not forget your word. Now, it's time for our praise time, and I have a lot to praise God about. After 45 days, I got my wife back. She's home. It's been uh, 45 days of having to go to the hospital every day to see her. And she's there in the back row, and praise God, she's doing okay. One more thing yet in the future, to finally get a knee put in so she can walk right now. I can still outrun her, but that won't happen forever. So. Uh, but I'm so thankful that, that the infection is gone and she's here. First Sabbath in, in, a, in several weeks. So I want to praise God for being with us during this time. And we want you to continue to pray uh, that the Lord will be with us as we go through the next step along in her recovery. It's your turn to praise God. I'm so happy when Nathan's here. I can choose a hymn that I am unable to play because I don't play in every key that's in the book. The Rock of Ages is one of those. So our opening hymn today is number 300, Rock of Ages, Clef for Me. It's a very popular old hymn. I just wish it was in a key that I could do so with. Shall we stand? Thank you. 
couple of texts for our scripture this morning. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 14 is the first one. And then we'll go to Romans 10, 4. First Corinthians 2, 7 through 14. But we speak the wisdom of God is a mystery, but even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I had not seen or hear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which he has prepared for him that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man? save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of, of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And then going to Romans, <clears throat> chapter 10, Verse 4. Romans chapter 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to one that believeth. May the Lord add to this blessing to the reading of his word. Are there special requests this morning? If you would, pray them silently as we kneel and seek the Lord in prayer. Our loving, merciful Heavenly Father, our Creator God, we come before you this morning praising your name for the good things we receive at your hand, for life and health and strength, for loved ones and family. We pray your blessing on those on our prayer list, physically, spiritually, mentally, and financially, as you can see fit. We pray for this church congregation. We pray for our speaker today. May you anoint his lips with the Spirit from on high. Give him the words to speak, so the message will be from you. We pray for your forgiveness, individually and collectively, to make us fit to come into your presence with your church, your people, in your house. We pray for your blessing to hold back the winds of strife, that the good news of your love can be spread to those around us through the whole world. We pray for your soon coming. Put an end to this mess that we're living in on this whole earth. Catch us up to meet, it, meet you in the clouds of heaven. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
we're missing Leone today. Pray for her that uh, she'll be able to accomplish what she needs to down in Belize. Uh, our offering today is for church expense. Everyone has been generous and uh, God has blessed us in our church expense, but let's continue so. Shall we, uh, shall the deacons come forward please? Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the generosity of your people and bless this church, I pray. Send your Holy Spirit into our lives that we may accomplish the work that you would have for us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. on the left hand and then the rabbit is going towards the right. I'm sure you all figured it out. Right? Where I'm going with this is there's always a present truth and there's always a precious truth. And truth is precious. But there's always going to be a present truth. For these reasons, even when we get to heaven, we'll still be learning. The theme that I want to present today is seeing truth from two aspects. The first aspect is from the physical. The second aspect is the spiritual. If you only catch the physical and not the spiritual, that same truth that was wonderful and mighty to build your house on will become sand later. Because there's, there's a devil who's masterful at taking truth and using it against you. It should never happen. But it can. And it will if you don't see past the physical into the spiritual. Just a kind of overview of this journey. This is more going to be a discussion 
than just simply sermonizing. So if you got something to say, just raise your hand and say it. We'll talk about it. I'm going to speak a little bit about Eve, a little bit about a man named Dimitri Mendeleev, Abram, the children of Israel, the spiritual nature of the law, Nicodemus, A.T. Jones, and Mary Madeline. So keep in mind, a truth helps us, but if we're not careful, it'll be the same truth that hurts us. Because every truth has a spiritual application. If God tells you to do something in the physical, that's not the end all be all. If God tells you to sacrifice a lamb, please don't be under the perception that that's the end all be all. That lamb is leading to something, it's pointing to something spiritual. Now, when God created the heavens and the earth, the Bible says it was very good. And the entire world was in perfect peace. Now, when you look into a spiritual concept, you get the deeper meaning. What Satan did, he talked Eve into disregarding the spiritual concept and to focus on the physical. Example, when Satan spoke to Eve and told her, hey, insinuated to eat from the tree, what did she tell him? No, the Lord's got strict instructions. We cannot eat from that tree. Satan started manipulating, and that same truth that she just stood on and said, no, we can't eat from that tree, now it's like, oh, he's withholding something from me. That same truth became poison because she wasn't seeing it to the spiritual. She didn't understand that anything that God had not given me, he didn't give it to me because I didn't need it. Rather than trying to search out, I gotta, God is holding back. Instead of trying to search out that which doesn't exist, she should have stood on the principle. Nevertheless, she did eat. And when she ate, she was not satisfied. She was dissatisfied. If a person is not satisfied, they can be bought and sold. As a car salesman, one of the first things they want to do is bring you to the knowledge that you're not satisfied with your car. You've got to get rid of this thing. You'll get rid of this thing today. As soon as they can get you to feel dissatisfied, now you are ready to be bought and sold. Spiritually speaking, that's what happened. That takes us to our first scripture. Let's go to James chapter 4. You know, there's wars taking place all over in this planet right now. Two days ago, I ran into a gentleman uh, that I knew for a long time, and uh, his 19-year-old son joined the army. Now, now he's in Iraq right now. You know, there's a war in the Congo, Syria. But all those wars are just a reflection of the wars that's taking place in our homes. And the wars that's taking place in our homes are taking place because of our members, that sin that's in our members. James chapter four, it says, chapter four, verse one, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? You see, one of the things that Eve passed down to all of us is a dissatisfied spirit. That's why, I kind of spoke a little bit about this in Sabbath school, if all you see is the Sabbath 
as an obligation, you can never keep it. It's a spiritual concept that God has given to us in the physical to guide us on to the spiritual. But before sin, the Sabbath existed. The entire law was wrapped up in the Sabbath. If you break one, you break them all. To truly keep one, you've kept them all. But guess what? That perfect peace was disrupted. If we want to really get something out of the Sabbath, we got to go past the physical and find out what is this spiritual rest that God is seeking for us to have. I spoke with Isaiah last Sabbath, and we just, we just rode around, and then we ended up uh, just at Maiden Park, just looking at nature. And we both came to the conclusion, we're not getting but maybe 9% of the Sabbath that's available to us. Hmm. There is a spiritual rest, there's a spiritual concept that will cause us to be elevated to truly be children of God. Eve was dissatisfied, unsatisfiable. That was passed down to us. That's why we the, the lust and the wars come from our members. We're looking for rest in all the wrong places. And the Sabbath is not just isolated as, okay, it's just that day. Now, the seventh day is the Sabbath, but if, if James says to break one law, you broke them all, The stuff I'm doing on Tuesday is affecting the Sabbath. You see what I'm saying? Because I am building up momentum towards unrest. As I'm doing, as I'm taking my mind off of God on Tuesday, I'm building up momentum of unrest. And then God can pour out rest on me, but it not have an effect on me. It's just like uh, we pray for rain a lot. And rightfully so, we live in a dry climate. But spiritually speaking, what if God gave us rain every day, but we don't drink water? You see what I'm saying? What's more important, the ground getting water or your body? Both. Right. So if, if you are having some unrest in your life, go to God and ask him to reveal to you the true nature, the spiritual nature. Sabbath is a spiritual concept. Ask him to reveal to you the spiritual element of that rest that you might be missing. And once God told Adam, his consequence and Eve her consequence and explained that he would enter into a world that he did not create. God didn't create chaos. He created perfect peace. But he said, I'm coming into this chaos. Adam looked at Eve and said, woman, your name is Eve. He said, if you go to Genesis 5, let me just go there real quick. Genesis 5. It said in chapter 1, excuse me, Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 says, This is the book of generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day that they were created. Eve didn't have a name. Their name was Adam. Adam, woman, your name is Eve, the mother of the living. Showing Adam understood. He understood. Okay. And that was proof of his faith, that he believed that God would come into this hostile environment. So this, this concept of names being changed, 
symbolic of character starts from Genesis to Revelation. Now this picture right here, which has got a microscope and we've got a telescope, because that's what faith is. Faith allows you to pierce into deep things and things beyond today. You can only benefit from prophecy by faith. And you can only benefit from doctrine by faith. A microscope and a telescope at the same time. Now this is coming out of Strong's, uh, Charles, you may know how to pronounce that word, I'm not even going to try. But basically that's the word used for wisdom. The description says, in a good sense, skillful wisdom, wisely, wit, the ability to follow the best course of action based on knowledge and understanding. This is coming out of the SDA Bible Commentary, volume 3, page 984. It says, instead of the ideal wisdom, the New Testament speaks of righteousness. Example, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So all that the Old Testament was saying about wisdom, the New Testament simply speaks as righteousness. And when you have the faith of Jesus, what comes with that is the mind of Jesus. Philippians 2.5 Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So do I need to seek out wisdom? You know, become a philosopher? Or do I simply need Jesus formed in me? Exactly. It's just like you got the fruit of the Spirit. If you got the Spirit, you got all the fruit. Uh, I heard Charles point out, it's not called fruits, plural. Fruit. If you got the Spirit, you got the fruit. You got the faith of Jesus, you got the mind of Jesus. It's one package. Now I'm going to speak about this gentleman, Dimitri Mendeleev. This is a rendition of somebody practicing what's called alchemy. What? Alchemy. alchemy. It's a dark practice in general, but the concept is being able to turn one element into another element. Right. Maybe uh, somebody said, I'm going to turn lead into gold, or I'm going to create the fountain of youth create a potion. And the concept was elements can convert to other elements. And the first guy who was considered a chemist was an alchemist who basically was uh, heating up his urine and it came into a paste that turned into phosphorus. Thus, chemistry was formed, and they kind of started getting away from the alchemy in the sense of, okay, that's, that's child's play. This is professional, so to speak. But people have always, and people always will continue to practice witchcraft in general. This is Dimitri Mendeleev. Mm -hmm. This is the guy who created what we know today as the periodic table. Chemistry had become unruly in the sense that there was no organization. Everybody was just coming out with elements. Some was not even elements. Some people said light is an element, you know, which is it's not. Some people said heat was an element. So they, they, they had to come up with a system to try to distinguish between what's really an element, what's not an element, and what do we do with the elements that are truly elements. Well. He understood this concept that they, they're in groups of families. So you've got phosphorus, uh, sodium, potassium, calcium. They're a family. And then you've got the uh, noble gases, argon, neon, xenon. These are families. And it changed chemistry forever in a great way. 
Because now it started hammering out these patterns in nature. But Mendeleev, he presented that periodic table as something that would kill alchemy forever, saying elements are fixed. They don't move. So get away from trying to uh, turn lead into gold. Elements don't move. They're fixed. They cannot be moved. This man, uh, his periodic chart was so accurate that he started lining up the known elements. And where there was gaps, he started predicting what the element, the properties of the element would be once it's found. And he told these are the properties. Go out and find them. And they did. They went out and found them. The first one that was found was found by a French chemist uh, discovered gallium. It's an element so soft that it melts in your hand. And when he presented it, he put the properties, Mendeleev, who had never even seen the element, said, "Now nah, you're wrong. Go back and check it out. You're wrong. Without even seeing it, the gentleman went back and checked it, and sure enough, Mendeleev was right. And he had properly placed it in the periodic chart where it was supposed to be. The next two people you see, this is Marie Curie and her husband Pierre. They discovered radium. And not only did they discover radium, but Marie Curie, she coined that term radioactivity. Mendeleev became a fierce enemy to them because radioactivity, what that means is elements, as they break down, they give off energy and change into other elements. And in Mendeleev's mind, y'all taking me back to alchemy. So he fought a tooth and nail to the day he died. See, he wasn't understanding truth is not isolated. According to Peter, there's no private interpretations, nor can truth be mastered. You see, we could, we could sum up the periodic table from a spiritual sense and say, fruit of the spirit. Yeah, love, joy, peace, temperance, kindness, patience, long-suffering. You got, you got individual elements, but it's just simply the fruit of the spirit. And he was wrong in the sense of thinking, no, that can't be possible. Now it, it is completely unrefutable. And even in his day, had he humbled himself, he would have realized it was unrefutable then. Unrefutable at that time. So, so that same truth that helped Mendeleev in one aspect turned around and was the same truth that became a stumbling block to him. As we go forward, we're going to see a pattern. Somebody's standing on truth and then it's the same truth that trips them up. This statement on the screen says, where God, where God guides, he provides. If God is taking you somewhere, he is going to make sure and see you through it. Now think about Abram. Think about Abram. A man who God told him, get out of your country, get away from your kinsmen, and go to a land that I'll send you to. He didn't, he didn't tell him the destination. He said, let's go. And Abraham stepped out there. He didn't have everything uh, neatly put together, but he moved. He moved with great faith. That's why he's considered the father of faith. Question. If this man would leave his family, his country, go into a place where he doesn't really know where he's going, Charles, why would he lie and tell the king of Egypt, Sarah's sister? He trusted himself. We, we, we don't, we're not perfect. He wasn't. Okay. But he's trusted. Still, in spite of that. Yeah. And I don't contest what you said, Charles, but his problem was he lost sight of his faith. That's it. Faith allows you to see beyond the physical into the spiritual. Example. 
that's kind of a, a rendition of that area of where Jerusalem is today. For whatever reason, he started thinking that's, that's all God had for him. A physical strip of land. Therefore, when he saw himself in danger, he had no, that's my sister. I've got to get to this land that God is trying to bring me to. Well, if God guides, God will provide. And when he lied and said that was his sister, God sent terror through the heart of the uh, king of Egypt. <laughs> and he said, now get up out of here right now. Go. Because God said, I'm going to take you to a land. It was a promise. It was a promise. So that same truth that God gave Abraham, that he stood on, that God was going to give him a land, now it became a stumbling block when his life was quote unquote in danger. But when he pointed his eyes back to the spiritual concept by faith, we get this understanding of Hebrews chapter 11. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, 9 through 10. You see, once Abraham got out of the physical and got back to the spiritual, then he understood something. While y'all turning there, physically speaking, Abraham never even made it to the promised land. Did God fail him? No, sir. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. By faith, speaking of Abraham, by faith, he sauntered in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, their heirs with him, of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Once Abraham got his mind off of a literal promised land and onto a spiritual promised land, then he understood. And he was able to prosper and go from Abram to Abraham. Now, why did Abraham have to be consulted by God that he needed to be circumcised? Because he trusted in his flesh. Therefore, God told him, remove the foreskin. But that wasn't God's original. Adam wasn't circumcised. That tells you right there, there has to be more than just physically putting off the flesh. Let's go to Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2. <coughs> Paul wrote this letter to the Colossians who were accepting the gospel, but they were being told by those who was caught up in the, the physical saying, oh, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. You need to start doing this, you need to start doing that. And Paul is trying to tell him, no, take your eyes to the spiritual. Colossians 2, we'll start with verse 8. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. For some reason, they began to believe that there was some kind of righteousness in actual circumcision. 
There is no doctrine, there is no reform that God tells you to do that brings righteousness. Only Jesus Christ can bring righteousness. That's true. That's a rendition of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Continuing on with Abram, why did he think he could sleep with Hagar and fulfill God's mission? Once again, he lost sight. He lost sight. <laughs> he got caught up in the spiritual, the physical, and missed the spiritual. If God simply wanted kids, God, God, God spoke to them through John the Baptist and said, "We can bring children of Abraham from these stones." If God just simply wanted more human bodies, He could have done that. But God was trying to bring forth a holy nation, holy people from Abraham. And I, I believe Abraham understood that only God can make something or someone holy. Therefore, he should have understood by faith in seeing spiritual concepts, me simply just having a child with another woman to fulfill the promise is not going to actually fulfill the promise. That's why Isaac had to come by supernatural means. We have to be born again by supernatural means. In Hebrews chapter 4, 1 through 3, it says the children of Israel had the same gospel preached to them, but it did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith. It was not mixed with faith. Meaning, everything that God said for them to do, they was hyped up to do it. Very hyped up to do it. But they went about the wrong way of doing it. It's like God, the children of Israel saying, all that God says we will do. Right. Can't do it. Right. Exactly. Because God will tell you in John 14, 15, keep my commandments. <laughs> Please don't bust out the back door trying to keep his commandments. Because in the very next chapter, John 15, he turned around and says, without me, you can do nothing. You see, he gave them a spiritual concept that had a deeper meaning than their physical. Many people were walking around thinking they were commandment keepers, but Jesus said, if you have hate for your brother, you're a murderer. If you look on a woman to lust, you have committed adultery already. Exaggerating is a form of lying. Because the law is spiritual. It's, it's deep. It's beyond what we can perform in the physical. Therefore, Christ formed in you is the hope of glory. I'm not going to dwell on this for too long because i got to keep moving, but a couple weeks ago, my life was changed right here in the sanctuary. I got up from a prayer, and I've seen my true condition clearer than I've ever seen it. Around this time, two years ago, 2017, I preached a sermon called The Biz Mark Leviathan. When I, and I was talking about the connection between the foolish virgins. And now, a person can be doing things that are positive, but still have pride. That would make you a foolish virgin. But I still didn't get it. No. I still didn't get it until about three weeks ago when God was showing me anything that you do, uh, if you're teaching uh, Bible classes like uh, Charles does. If you are keeping the health message, if you are keeping the Sabbath, if you are paying your tithes, great things, I vouch for them. Nevertheless, your character is not being changed, miss the boat. It's a spiritual concept. And that, that's what I didn't realize about my life. My circumstances were changing, but my character wasn't. You can pay your tithes, and your money will increase. But that doesn't guarantee that your character is being changed. It should, and it would, 
if you caught the spiritual aspect. But if we're doing religious things, and yet those religious things are not changing our character, just our circumstance, we are deceived. Deceived. That's a check for a million dollars. To have truth, doctrines, revivals, and reforms is, is to possess a million dollar check. But the goal is Christ formed in you. Or should I say, the check cashed and in your bank account is the hope. That's the hope. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And we'll pick up in verse 20. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In Galatians 3, Paul says the law was our schoolmaster until faith came. The purpose of the law is to reveal to you that which you could not see on your own. But in tables of stone, there is no life. Jesus Christ is the law of the Spirit. The law of God is now manifest without the law, but witnessed by the law and the prophets. Meaning, well, let me just say it like this. Uh, a while back I preached a sermon about uh, iron and lead. And iron being, being faith and lead being doubt. And then we spoke about how you can't just go into the dirt and say, oh, I'm lacking iron. Start scooping up dirt and eating dirt. It's inorganic. Your body can't process it. You need a middleman, like a carrot, some beets. You, you, you need a substance that can grab the iron and put it in an organic state. Christ is that carrot. Christ is that carrot. Go with me to Romans 10. Romans 10, verse 1. J.D. read verse 4. We're going to start with 1 and get the context. Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And to be saved means made whole. It doesn't mean that you punch your ticket to heaven. Jesus Christ became a man forever. He became one of us, and he sits on the right hand of God, representing humanity. Unless I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to sit right at the right hand of God. Therefore, heaven's doors is open to anybody who has been made whole. We sin because we are broken people. The spiritual concept of the health message is to help us build healthy relationships. It's not to live only. John 17, 3 says, to believe on God and whom he has sent is the beginning of eternal life. If my focus is only living longer, I'm not understanding John 17, 3. Or I don't believe. Either way, my faith has lost sight of spiritual concepts a bad attitude is, is, is the first sign of unhealthiness pride is a sign you're sick selfishness you're sick so on and so forth the health message is about helping us become healthy people so that we can breed healthy relationships because the way you view God 
is seen in how you treat other people. Jesus said, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. There's a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, this Spirit of Prophecy that says, one of the reasons why truth is not rooted into the heart is because people have the wrong estimation of who God is. They see his character in the light that's not truly him. But she says, sometimes some people are so strong-willed that they will still come into the truth. Yet their pride has not been subdued. And that was me. I was strong-willed and, and, and accepted it, but I had the wrong aspect of who God was. And it was seen in the way I was treating his people because Jesus formed himself to every individual. John 1 says he was the light that lighted every man and woman that cometh into the world. He joined himself and personally lived your life for you. And whether a person chooses to follow him or not, Jesus has still formed himself with that person. Therefore, how I treat that person, that's how I'm treating Jesus. So you got to understand that salvation is not a, a business transaction with God. To where God is like, your employee, and uh, you better do what he say, and hey, he manipulate me, I manipulate him there, and we, we got the end goal is to just sell cars. Uh-uh. I didn't choose to be on this planet, and I didn't do anything to put myself here. God chose to put me here. Because God loved me with an everlasting love, pure agape, and he is not going to let me self-destruct or let the devil snatch me out of his hands. I determined that. But God is going to do everything physically and spiritually possible to prevent that because he loves me. And he loves every one of you. And, and how I truly view him is going to be seen in how I treat you. Therefore, to be kingdom-minded is to receive these spiritual concepts here. Not physically alone, but spiritually. This is a butterfly coming out of the cocoon. The Christian life is not a modification of the old. It's not an improvement. I don't pull in in my car and God says, well, I'm going to give you a new exhaust pipe. I get a brand new car. It's a transformation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Old things are old. New things are new. Focus on the covenant. When it comes, when it comes to the law, let me, let me read Romans 10, because I've never read Romans 10. Brethren, my desire and prayer for God, prayer to God for Israel, is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they are being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believe. Once Christ is formed in you, that's the end of the law. The word end means the fulfillment, the summation, the grand position. So if I step out here and say, oh, I'm, I'm going to start doing this, I'm going to be deceived. I need to first focus on my character so that as I do those things, I will have the physical and the spiritual. Nicodemus, that's what we're now on him. You could basically call Nicodemus Jerusalem's best in the flesh. The best Jerusalem had to offer. Come to Christ. It's me. I'm here. Jesus looked him square in the eyes and said, unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that stirred up his flesh. Be like, you, know, you must not know what I've been doing around here. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith is a yoking up with Jesus to where you and Jesus become one. If you do something outside of Jesus, 
It's an abomination to God. And the more Jesus was piercing at Nicodemus, the more his flesh started coming out. What you want me to do? Get back in my mama's womb? Jesus, Jesus did not re react to him with the flesh. Jesus stayed in the spiritual. He said, you're a ruler in Israel. You don't know these things. That which is spirit is spirit. That which is flesh is flesh. The wind listed or bloweth where it wants to, and you don't know where it's going. The wind is invisible, but you see its effects. The spirit, invisible, but the effects are seen clearly. Especially if you are looking from the spiritual, because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. I wish I would have knew in 2009 when I entered to this church that God just did not simply want me to keep to change days. They say Sunday, we say Sabbath day. It was more than that. Change character, well, change character. Now, this gentleman right here, his name is A.T. Jones, one of our pioneers. Uh, in about 1886, he began to put out powerful messages through one of our publications, The Signs of the Times. And in 1888, himself, uh, E.J. Wagner, uh, Kellogg, Prescott, Miss White, Stephen Haskell, several, several others began to see, hey, hey, we've missed something, guys. And that's why Ellen White makes a statement, we've preached the law or do something so long that we've become dry as the hills of Galboa. Meaning, never preach the law without the gospel. The law, if you love me, keep my commandments. The gospel, without me, you can do nothing. Because if you understand from the spiritual, I can't keep the commandments. They're spiritual. I'm carnal, Paul says in Romans 7. For the law is spiritual. I'm carnal, sold under sin. But Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. God gave Israel, the children of Israel, Christ, to be their righteousness. And it's no different, the same thing he gave Abraham. That's why Jesus says, Abraham rejoiced in me. Excuse me, Abraham knew me and he rejoiced to see my day. And the reason why Jesus could say that is because Abraham, when he, when he, when he, he finally got to the point to where he had on the goggles of faith and no one was going to take him off. But whatever your character is, is symbolic of who your father is. Jesus said, he was speaking about John the Baptist who had just been murdered. He said, wisdom is known by her children. Wisdom is righteousness. The way a person reacts, it tells you where they got their insight from. For this reason, in John chapter 8, Jesus told them, you are of your father, the devil. The, he was talking to people who were doing a lot of things, but they were ignorant of God's righteousness. They had not made the prime example Christ being formed in them. They made their example all the things that they needed to do. And I'm about doing all those things. I believe in all those things. But now... I'm going to build my house on the rock, Christ Jesus, and not the sand of, hey, God said it. All that God said, I'm going to do. Because there's no righteousness. If I could do something to become righteous, God can never end the great controversy because that's the difference between Satan and his angels who will not get interested into heaven and sinners who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Because if it's coming down to good deeds, hypothetically speaking, let's say Satan lived 10,000 years before he fell off. He's got 10,000 years of good works. I don't have 35 years of good works. If, if I did it, he's got to get 
did if it's coming down to good works. But guess what? If somebody ever did a good work, it was Christ in them. From the beginning of time to the end of time. Exactly. So Satan can't claim God's righteousness. And that's why he can't make it in. But we have the privilege to claim God's righteousness. And we're getting in. By God's grace. Now this man, A.T. Jones, I put him on there. His situation kind of reminds me of Demetrius Mendeleev because he came with a powerful truth. Powerful truth. A message that was designed to prepare the world for translation. It was time. It was it. It was done. It was time. It was, it was the, we were stepping into what was supposed to be the final battle. And yeah, the brethren didn't necessarily handle them the right way. And a lot of egregious things was done towards him, but he allowed himself to get bitter. That means he lost sight of his own message. The things that he was saying, powerful, powerful. But to know those things and still become bitter, he started looking at the brethren as just other humans and not as Jesus. Jesus says, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Therefore, all the knowledge that we learn is, has one mission, one goal, to shape and forge Jesus in your life. He missed it. And to his dying day, as far as we know, he remained bitter. There was an account by Ellen White's son saying how uh, A.G. Daniels, the conference president at the time, and others had him in a circle and was like, okay. In a nutshell, babe, I, a lot that was done to you was wrong. And truth be told, he done some things wrong too. We forgive you. Forgive us. Let's, let's make it right. But instead of him shaking hands like Charles shook my hand, he would do like this. He, he never shook hands. He never just relinquished it. And had he done that, man, things would have been totally different. He loved the brothers, but not as himself. He kept the law in the letter, but not in the spirit. See, when it comes to doing this thing the right way, the tilling of the land is character. Start there. Start there. God changed my character. Don't start with, with uh, uh, reforms. Don't start with truth and knowledge. Those things are given. Those things come with Christ. The if you want the fruit of the Spirit, get the Spirit. The, this, this symbol right here is, okay, the land is being prepped for the seed. Now, I can't go into it today. Maybe uh, the next time I preach, I'll talk about the prepping of the land is the fear of God. You see, there's no difference between wisdom and righteousness. But the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So the very first step... Humbly coming before God. Falling on the rock and being broken. This emptying of self is not going out and doing something. Do you remember Paul said in Romans 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice? That tells you right there, God never wanted them. God got no pleasure out of them killing lambs. God wanted children. You are the sacrifice. You are what I'm seeking. And that's the fear of God. And that's where it starts. And after the fear of God, the seed, Christ. Abraham and his seed. Christ is planted into the heart. And then the early rain falls. That same rain that's been falling since Pentecost. And what that early rain does is all strictly predicated on character. It's not predicated on works. The works that are acceptable to God are the works that God does in you. Not separate. In you. And then after the early rain is the latter rain. Where your character will now come to full maturity. 
full maturity. <clears throat> now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to say a quick prayer because this is the the crust of the matter of what, what I'm about to end with. Heavenly Father, Lord, make this clear. I, I cannot convey this uh, <coughs> truly in the manner in which it should be. Do for me that which I cannot do. Give us ears of gold, Lord, so that we may hear what the Spirit says to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Speaking of the latter rain, if you go to Zechariah 10, 1, it talks about, let's just go there. It says, ask for the latter rain during the time of the latter rain. Zechariah 10, verse 1. Ask ye the Lord, rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Every one grass in the field. That's why I got a picture of just Notice that, that blade right there got his share. He got what the Lord was giving. And if the Lord, if I only get 9% of what the Lord is offering, I'm, uns now I'm unsatisfied with that. Man. Only those who are living up to the life that they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. Please catch this. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. Except you be born again, said Christ, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. To enter heaven, a man must have Christ formed within the hope of glory and take heaven with him. The Lord Jesus alone can fashion and change the character. What I want you to understand, the problem I had, I was perceiving that living up to the light was doing the things that God said to do. But living up to the light is developing the character of Jesus Christ. And as I develop that character, it's only natural for me to do everything that God has asked me to do because that's the only way I can do it. Paul says that the, the Jews, they were ignorant. They had zeal. They wanted to follow God, but without knowledge. Therefore, they tried to get righteousness without him. He said, I'm going to do all these things, and then after I do that, then my character is going to be formed. Deception. Christ alone can form the character. So if you're doing something to change your character, you're deceived. And God is here to remedy the defects right here, right now. Because we can come to Jesus, who alone can change the character. We don't do those things to change the character. We do those things because our character has been changed. Bear with me. We're, we're closing out. We're closing out. Bear with me. This is an example of how a seed works. I'm, I won't take, I won't have y'all turn to it, but John 12, 24, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a, a, a seed of corn die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. It has to die. So you start off with corn seed, and then as you start germinating, more of it dies. And then more dies. You see where it says foliage leaves? It, the corn is gone. It's dead. And then you got the blade. And then Christ formed in you is the full corn in the ear. Producing a wonderful harvest. Righteousness is by faith. And we end with our last character, Mary Madeline. Mary Madeline. Let's go to Matthew 26. As 
y'all turn in there. Faith says, I can stand on the word and the word alone. Meaning, we know we must die daily. Well, how do I die? Well, Galatians 2.20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and died for me. So what I'm saying is, you just move like you're already dead. Accept you're dead. That's what moving by faith is. Don't try to uh, do something. Don't try to do all these reforms to clean up your life when Jesus says, you are clean because of the word I've spoken unto you. We failed as a human race because Adam failed. Paul says Jesus is the second Adam. So the same way Adam failed and it affected us, don't y'all know Jesus Christ, the second Adam, went into the wilderness and shut down the devil? Lived right there. Right there. He lived the life that you need to enter into heaven. It's done. Walk as if what God has said is already in, in, in uh, manifestation. Now, if I believe I'm in a five-piece suit that's all white, if I truly believe that, I'm probably not going to play in the mud. Hmm. But if I believe I've got to clean myself up and develop a white suit, I'll be searching forever, trying to do all these things. And those things that God told me to do will benefit my circumstance and it'll deceive me to think, oh, I'm, I'm ready for the second coming. But I'm not ready for the second coming. Because even though it changed my circumstance, did it change your character? You see, we need to find ways to love each other and not find ways to be separate. Y'all think Jesus Christ is a cowboy fan? Or is he a red skin fan? Y'all think God the Father uh, is a Democrat? Or is, is, is the Holy Spirit a Republican? You see, this, we, got, we got more than enough ways to be separate. But it's time to press together in love. For Jesus said, my disciples shall be known by their love. See, I missed that. I, wanted, I, was, I was doing all these things, but my love for the brethren was not spilling over. It was not spilling over. Now, this woman right here, Mary Madeline, she went through that process. You see, when Jesus first uh, encountered her, I don't know if it was the first encounter, but she's brought, caught in adultery. And what did she not do? She did not justify. The accusers was on her. Uh, it, it, this, was, this could have been a death sentence. Not a word came out of her mouth. Jesus, where is your accusers? They're gone. Go and sin no more, is what Jesus told them. Go and sin no more. Did she have trouble after that? Absolutely. Nevertheless, the seed was planted, and the word cannot come back void. It's going to do what God called it to do. Now, if you don't respond to it, that's on you, but the seed is not impotent. It's going to do. But she continued on. Let me read Matthew 26, starting in verse 6. Now when Jesus was in Bethany, the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he said it be. And when the disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye this woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you. But you, excuse me, but me you have not always. For in that she had poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world there shall also this woman that which this woman hath done be told for a memorial for her Mary Magdalene wasn't making excuses she, she was able to confess with a sincere heart and notice every time we turn around somebody talking about Mary Magdalene but we don't see Mary Magdalene talking about nobody else 
And then she brought this alabaster box, symbolic of her will. It was symbolic of her will. And that was to anoint Jesus' burial. You think she was just so bright that she was like, I need to bring some anointment for Jesus' burial. <laughs> no, the Holy Spirit told her to bring that. And she brought, she brought that, which was very costly, but nothing more, in the spiritual sense, nothing more costly than her will, showing this. When, when that seed germinated, and she came out the blade, and then Christ formed in her the ear of the corn, then she started doing everything God wanted her to do. It was at the death of Christ, the crucifixion. When Peter was betraying Christ, and all the disciples had ran away, and only John is there, she's there. At the tomb, preparing the body, she's there. Coming back to see him, she's there. Following the Lamb, whithersoever he went. You see, once God has your will, he's got everything he needs. Give him your will, and he will bring you to a position where you are now a partaker of the divine nature. So yoking with Jesus is the first move. Don't think you got to go out and do something to try to improve your character. It's false. You can't. Those things don't improve character. Those things maintain that which God has done. So yoke up with him. Yoke up with him. That's a, that's, that's a Bible that looks like a loaf of bread around it. Read the Bible as food for thought. Not trying to find something to do. Because you will seek righteousness, there's no righteousness at all. We've come to the last slide. And I don't know how much time we spent today. Forgive me, but God bless you. Behold the Lamb of God. That was a spiritual term. Yet they still ask me, who's the Messiah? Jesus, tell us right now if you're the Messiah. Tell us right now. John pointed to this man and said, Behold the Lamb of God. Physically, that's all they can see. But spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Behold your lamb who died for you. Behold your king, your individual, personalized savior. When God deals with me, he ain't worried about you. When he's dealing with you, he ain't worried about me. Now, collectively, he is always worried about all of us. But he is your personal savior. Blessedly, me and Brittany about to have a child. But who cares? If my child going to heaven and I'm going to end up You see, God didn't give people children just to be having children. He's repopulating heaven. There's a spiritual concept. Don't miss it. Don't miss the spiritual. The reason why the pride is strong is because if pride is strong, it's because you are trusting in your works, subconsciously or unconsciously. Because I'm, I'm ending with this. I'm ending with this. In Revelation 3, when it talks about us being lukewarm, that's not something that I graduate to. I'm no longer lukewarm. That's all I can be outside of Jesus. And that's a straight testimony. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just want to pour out our heart to you right now and receive the Holy Spirit. Let us be born again. Lord, we come before you like Nicodemus, needing to be elevated into the spiritual and not just the physical. Let us remember, Lord, we have to have a right concept of you in order to have the right character formed in us. And we know if our estimation of you is right or wrong based on how we treat each other. If I wouldn't do it to you, and I do it to someone else, then I gotta go back to the drawing board. In Jesus' name, Lord, let us forever be changed this day. Amen. Amen.